Uh, welcome everyone. This is the new uh, episode of the podcast series of the Global Judicial Integrity Network. We are here with uh, Judge Judith Jones of Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about uh, access to justice and fair trials uh, for women. Uh, Judge Jones, could you please briefly describe your current professional role and your involvement in the updating of the domestic violence le legislation in Trinidad and Tobago? I am at present a judge of the Court of Appeal in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, in that capacity, unfortunately, I do not do a lot of domestic violence cases. In fact, I don't do any at all. But in my private practice, I was involved quite heavily in dealing with pri um, domestic violence matters, primarily as a lawyer representing um, survivors of domestic violence. Um, I also had some input into the present domestic vi violence legislation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the position in Trinidad and Tobago. We basically have a quite relatively progressive act in that it treats with, um, not only with domestic, but with protection orders, but it allows the applicant to receive financial orders, which of course, as we all know, assists in a determination to leave the matrimonial home or the, the, the home in which the violence is occur has occurred. Um, our disadvantage in our act, however, is that it is very limited in its ambit in that it does not deal with same-sex relationships, and that's something that we are trying our best to have change in Trinidad and Tobago, but it's happening very, very slowly. Um, we, in Trinidad and Tobago, we just last week had um, a report from the government which identified that between the period January to September 2018, there have been 847, sorry, 45 reports of domestic violence. Um, of those reports, 665 were made by women and 180 by men. Our population is just about 1.5 million. So it's, those statistics are very alarming. Um, another concern that we have is that um, we very recently published IDB, published a report, a health report, but it also showed that 26% um, of those persons who experience intimate partner violence went to the police. And of, with respect to those who accessed the court, unfortunately, it was only 6%. It shows a lack of confidence in our judiciary with respect to how we treat with um, domestic violence. And it's difficult to identify all the reasons for this lack of confidence, but I think that one of the things that we need to treat with is the attitude of the judicial officers. Um, you know, it's... Um, one of the problems we have, of course, is systemic delay. We are a third world country. They are, um, all these cases are competing for space and time so that um, there is that difficulty. Um, the other difficulty, of course, is just pure ignorance and indifference on the part of the judicial officer and um, also a lack of faith in the enforcement proceedings in how you inf actually enforce the orders. I think for this, for the purposes of this discussion here, I want to treat a little bit with the indifference and ignorance. Um, our Judicial Education Institute has been doing a lot of training with judicial officers. And, um, but there are two things that we need to do. We need to, first of all, to ensure that judicial officers not only understand the, what's contained in the legislation, but also understand gender-related issues. Um, we find that unless that is done, the judicial officer just does not have a clue about what the survivors of domestic violence have to undergo. So you have questions, well, you know, if it, the violence is so bad, why don't you leave? Now, that's not a valid question. There are a lot of 
varying reasons for the person staying in the home. So that's one of the key things that we need to, to emphasize and treat with. Um, the other thing, of course, and it's something that I feel very strongly about, is that in terms of judicial appointments, we must start ensuring that people who are appointed to the bench have a concept of gender and the, the different power structures that are involved there in order to treat with the problem. And I think unless we do that, we're not going to have the confidence in the court that is required. And of course, if we don't have that, then our do domestic violence statistics will continue to rise. And uh, in your opinion, uh, Judge Jones, how can judiciaries be strengthened to appropriately handle cases of sexual or gender-based violence besides the, the one yes. word you told us? Yes, besides <laughs> training and um, understanding. Yeah. I think we have to, um, first of all, deal with the question of delay immediately. As we all know, delay is, you know, a delay in dealing with these um, cases is a matter, can be a matter of life or death. So I think that we have to put in place systems that would allow a judicial officer to treat with the cases practically immediately and also avoid repeat adjournments. Um, I think, you know, once someone comes into court, they expect relief immediately. And if we don't give them that relief, then they're going to go away. And once they go away, the, the violence continues. We have a number of statistics with death, you know, by, by, through intimate partner violence. And, and I think that the first step must be treating with the delay in the courts. And that may be setting up specified courts for dealing with domestic violence matters. That's certainly very interesting. And uh, also maybe linking this uh, to judicial uh, ethics, uh, how do you think that existing judicial codes of conduct address the duties of judges under existing legislation relating to violence against women? Uh, if they actually address yeah. it or well, I think, not, yeah, I think and that's if they do, how they do yeah, it? I think that's the whole point. They actually do not, at least our code definitely doesn't. Um, it, to some extent, deals with dealing with court cases promptly, dealing with them to the best of your ability and uh, with, with integrity. But I think one of the difficulties that we have is that, um, of course, the system doesn't necessarily allow promptness. But also, I th our courts must treat with compulsory Edu training and education for lawyers, of, sorry, for judges. And if we do that and impose gender training, it will certainly assist. In fact, it will go a long way to, to making us more responsive to the problem. And, uh, and is additional training for judges enough to empower women to bring their cases to court? Or are there further measures that are also necessary? No, I think there are definitely further measures that are necessary just to, to ensure that there is some public, conf public confidence in the judiciary. Um, so we will also have to do our, ourselves do trading. We will have ourselves to do education programs so that people can understand what are the types of orders that we can make. For example, we can make financial orders on a domestic violence application. But I don't think that people, that, that the, the survivor for, uh, always understands that. So that unless you come into court, you won't know. And if you don't know, sometimes you won't come into court. Because the economics of the situation, sometimes it's really the, the key thing. If you can't afford to, to get out of the relationship, then you're not going to, to try. And uh, that also links to the issue of transparency of courts, not only of, of the court proceedings, the processes, but also of the administration of the courts and uh, the internal affairs of the court, so how training is done. Uh, do you think that is also a measure that the judiciaries can use to uh, empower women to bring more cases? I think so. The difficulty that we have is that 
in a lot of cases, training is centered internally. It looks internally rather than externally. So um, one of the things that, that we must do, and uh, at the survey shows that it's absolutely necessary if 6% of women, are only 6% are accessing the court, is training and education so that members of the public can understand that. So it is that judiciaries also have to put in place public education programs. Mm. Um, and yes, it, it, it will help with transparency and, and again, maintaining public confidence in, in what we do. Mm. And uh, in what other types of cases just, uh, does gender-based violence manifest itself? So maybe not only the cases that are brought to court, yes. but also uh, in the internal uh, works of the courts, within uh, the courts, what other cases? Uh? Well, l perhaps I could deal with it in two ways. Um, as you know, we've just published our gender equality protocol. And that, that um, posits an idea that if we use gender sensitive adjudication, we can use it in any situation where there's in unequal power structures. So that, in fact, goes across all the, the um, facets of court life, because that's really what litigation is about. So that um, using that sort of thinking will, of course, assist not only with um, violence, it will assist in any, uh, any unequal um, power-based litigation. The second is that, of course, um, we do not as yet um, use gender-based thinking in the appointment of judges. Now, that goes right back to my, my um, first point, About is that, yes, yeah. that it, it is important when you're selecting judges to understand that gender applies to everyone, so that every single person that comes before the court um, there are gender stereotypes that, that attach to those. And just as we deal with bias, with judges and their biases, we also have to recognize that there are inherent biases with respect to gender stereotypes. So that unless we identify those early before appointment, we, we are doing like what we say in Trinidad, we're spinning top in mud, meaning that we're getting nowhere unless we can you know, say, well, this person is not suited because there are by inherent biases which we cannot solve, we can't, we can't correct. Um, so the gender and a person's thinking on gender is extremely important with respect to the selection of judges. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Jones. Uh, so this was uh, another episode of the podcast series of the Global Judicial Integrity Network. Uh, this time uh, we were here with Judge uh, Judith Jones of Trinidad and Tobago to discuss more about access to justice and fair trials for women. Uh, if you're interested in uh, learning more about the gender protocol of the Trinidad and Tobago Judiciary, uh, it is also available in the uh, resource database of the Judicial Integrity Network website. So uh, if you're interested, uh, do check it out. Uh, thank you so much, uh, thank Judge you. Jones. Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, and stay tuned for other episodes of our podcast series.